Now, as you get into the Constitutional Convention, what you see on the screen is, what, what Bob the Builder? Can we fix it? And really the question is focusing on the Articles of Confederation. Now we've called this meeting and we're gathered together. The question is, can we fix the problem we created by creating the Articles of Confederation? And that really is what we want to focus on here. Because this meeting, this Constitutional Convention, that's called, this is not just simply to create a government. Its initial purpose is to fix a government that has been deeply sort of messed up. It's been deeply flawed from the very beginning. And so there's really a fix-it attitude that's here, not just simply a creative attitude. When the Constitutional Convention is called in May of 1787 in the city of Philadelphia, they return themselves back to this place we call Independence Hall. And to Independence Hall is a place that is really relied upon because it is centrally located in the, in the uh, states, because it is a large enough uh, place, because they're used to being there. It's a, it, Philadelphia's a big city. It's got the necessary hotels, motels, we want to call them that, okay? Uh, boarding houses, as they call them then. Or, or restaurants, taverns, as they call it then. But they're going to need some place to stay, some place to eat, because these men are coming from many different states, from different directions. The purpose of this Constitutional Convention, when it's initially called, about a year before May of 1787, it's being referred to really as an attempt to revise the Articles. So what they know, though, is this, that if you're going to revise the Articles, that in any way you're going to amend the Articles of Confederation, you have to have 13 states agree to it. Well, what if 13 states don't show up? That's the problem they've been having leading up to the Constitutional Convention. Whenever they have meetings, some states just don't show up, and very often the state that doesn't is Rhode Island. Turns out that what they've agreed to here is something that, well, maybe you think of it's just kind of a little bit sneaky, but the idea is that 13 states have to agree to the changes. Does that mean that 13 states have to be part of the discussion of what those changes will be? And it turns out that they sort of saw it that way. They said, well, so what if a state doesn't show up? We'll, we'll sit down, make our agreement, write it all out. We'll present it to all the states, including the one that didn't show up. And let's just hope that that one agrees to the changes at that point. And so the purpose, again, is to revise the articles. Now, James Madison becomes very instrumental here. During the month of May, people are showing up at different times. Notice they don't say, on this particular date in May, show up, and we're going to start meeting. Instead, what they say is, in May, start gathering in Philadelphia. And as people begin to show up, James Madison is going to take the time to talk to them. He's going to take the time to sort of pick their brain. What are you thinking about? What are you here for? What do you hope to achieve? And he's also, of course, planting seeds. He's saying, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm thinking about suggesting and so on. And he's really trying to figure out what kind of support there is for keeping the articles and just revising it versus trashing the whole thing, starting over, and creating a brand new government. As a result, when the meeting starts, it's James Madison's ideas that are going to become sort of the, the backbone of the, of the Constitution. The basic foundation, the basic outline or map of the Constitution is from what James Madison's plan is going to be called, the Virginia Plan. James Madison, therefore, becomes known as the father of the Constitution. The first order of business for this convention is going to be to really organize the meeting. And in every meeting, there's got to be a person who's in charge of the meeting, who's sort of the coordinator, the person who's going to make sure that the meeting flows, it stays on pace, that people are not being rude to each other and stepping on each other when they're trying to talk. And so George Washington is selected for this position simply because he's a general. He's got the presence, he's got the respect, he's got the kind of authority um, that really allows him to, to be the person in charge. So the first order of business for the Continental Congress, excuse me, the Confederation Congress, their first order of business, of course, is to get their meeting organized. They need someone to be in charge of this meeting to make sure that the meeting flows, is organized, that people know their responsibilities, but also so that people know um, really how they're going to have this conversation and so that it's not something that turns into this sort of blown out argument. And so what they do is they select George Washington. He's selected as the president of this continental, sorry, this uh, constitutional convention. And the idea here is, well, being a military man, this guy knows how to command 
really people. He knows how to make sure that they understand what their responsibilities are. But the thing is also, he's got this incredible presence and a deep respect from most people. And so he sits at the front of the room and he really isn't part of the conversation directly. He is just basically in charge of things. So again, president of the, con the Constitutional Convention. But please understand this. This is not president of the United States. He's just selected as the head of the meeting. That's what he's there for. Now, when they begin to establish the rules, which is really the second thing that they're going to do here, first order of business, select a person in charge, second order of business, we got to set up some rules. You know, sort of like think of, for instance, classroom rules. When you're in a classroom, how do you recognize, well, you want to speak? Raise your hand. Well, they set up rules like that. The, more, probably the more important rule that we need to recognize right now is this, and that is most importantly that there needs to be secrecy. We cannot have people walking out of the room on a daily basis, taking what they've learned and what they've talked about and argued about in the room and sharing it with all the people on the outside of the building, which are probably piling up around the windows and the doors, because who's inside? Oh, it's George Washington, it's James Madison, it's John Adams. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And the result is they're thinking, okay, well, you know, I want to talk to these people. I want to see these people, but also... What are they talking about? And when it gets out there, it's going to be published in all the newspapers and spread throughout the states. And people are going to begin to go, ooh and ah. Oh, they're talking about this and that and this change and this and, and so on. And they're going to begin to make up their minds outside of the building, outside of the room, outside of the convention. They're going to make up their minds as to what they should think about it before they've even seen it. And this is the big problem for government. That when we get everyone involved in the conversation, there's just too many people that are contributing. We need to really kind of shrink it down to a small number of people, let them have their discussion, let them present it to us, and then we can make up our minds. But to, to try and argue it outside of the room is going to result in this government failing. And they know that from the beginning. So they agree to secrecy. They agree they're not going to talk about it. And, and even more so, because of that, because of the way that this building is, this Independence Hall, what a problem this is going to be if you look these windows are very low to the ground. People are going to be standing outside waiting and looking. What's going on? They're reading lips or eavesdropping at the very least. And so one of the um, aspects of this secrecy is that the people that are inside the room agree to close the, the windows and to close the shutters and to really block all the, the outside environment out. And they have to light candles to see. Here they are dressed in wool suits. And here it is July. Philadelphia, 90, 95, 100 degrees, 70% humidity, and they're roasting inside this room. So they're going to end up establishing a kind of an odd schedule. They're going to meet very early in the morning uh, most days, and they're going to work up to about 10 o'clock, take the afternoon off, continue working in the evening when it's cooler. And that gives them the afternoon, really, to focus upon, you know, maybe looking at the discussion from the morning and figuring out and thinking about what they want to say in the evening. And it really does facilitate it. It makes the, the meetings flow a little bit better. It also allows people to, you know, if you get an argument in the morning, you can always cool off in the afternoon, so to speak. And the result is hopefully the evening will be a better meeting. The Virginia plan. Now, one of the things that's really kind of important about the, this Virginia plan is to understand that although Madison, it's Madison's plan, although Madison is the guy who organizes and constructs and builds this plan, because he represents Virginia, it's referred to as the Virginia plan. He represents the, that state. He's one of several people that represent the state. And, uh, and Madison really is the person that promotes it. At the same time, remember, Madison's, Madison's idea here is going to become sort of the format or the outline of our government. The other thing about Madison is that Madison spends the, the entire time at the con Constitutional Convention he spends it taking notes, and he's looking at every single conversation and discussion, trying to really map out and organize. And it's part of it, partly because later on we start debating this government, and people are starting to decide whether they like it or not, and the states are accepting it or rejecting it. Madison wants to have a really kind of a documentation of what went on during the meeting that resulted in the decisions that were made. One of the first things that he suggests is a supreme national government. Now, this is the word supreme here means an awful lot, just so you know. It doesn't just mean that it's, it's big or famous or important or whatever. It means more powerful. It is more powerful than the states. And that's really what he wants to start with. We cannot have a government where the states are more powerful than the national government, unlike, like the articles. We have to have something that's very different. We have to turn the articles sort of upside down, make the national government more powerful than the states. We're going to have to have, of course, three branches of government. 
And that was something that, of course, wasn't a shock to anybody. They all knew that. Every state had three branches. National government didn't under the Articles. But we want to have three branches of government. And notice that the three branches are going to be selected by, starting with the legislative branch, they're going to choose then who's going to be the executive, and they're going to choose who's going to be in the judiciary. So those are selected by or chosen by the legislative branch. Next, we need to have built-in checks and balances. Now, built-in here means this, simply that when they write this government, they create it on paper, they're going to make sure that what they include in that description on paper is that each of the branches have basically uh, equal power, not power that is overwhelming. So we don't want the legislative branch having more power than the executive. We want them to have about equal power. And that each branch has checks or powers, but these powers that they, can, that they have some of them need to be specifically designed so they can use them against the other branches. Quite literally, use them against the other branches. So, for instance, that if the legislative branch thinks that the executive branch is, is really abusing its power, the legislative branch has certain powers they can use to get the, the executive branch to sort of tone it down, come back into line, and do the right thing. Then the last thing that he suggests really is this, is really the, the, the thing that's going to cause a lot of argument and that is a bicameral legislature. Now, we, we talked about the whole idea of unicameral versus bicameral. Uni meaning one, cameral meaning house, one house. Bicameral means obviously two houses. And this bicameral legislature that they decide, um, that they agree upon, is, is really kind of unique. Notice that the two parts of this bicameral legislature, we've got a House of Representatives and we've got over here a Senate. And the House of Representatives is going to be based totally on population. In other words, if you're a big state like New York, Madison is suggesting that states like New York and Pennsylvania and Virginia, obviously, Massachusetts, these big states, and we don't mean big here as in size, we mean big in terms of population, that these big states are going to have more votes. There's going to be more people sent to the House of Representatives from those states. Therefore, those, they're going to have more votes because every person that's sent in this system is going to be considered a vote. Well, what about the Senate? Well, the Senate's going to be chosen by the House. In other words, representation would be proportional in every sense, proportional. To what? Well, to the population of the state. So when you look at the House of Representatives and the Senate, it really is a reflection of the population of each and, each and every state. When you see the representatives from New York, it's proportional to the population of New York. And when you notice that well, Delaware has fewer representatives, it's because it's proportional to the population of Delaware. So what's the problem with this? The problem is pretty straightforward. The large states are going to have more votes. They're going to have more representatives and therefore they're going to have more power. That seems pretty obvious, and the large states are, of course, happy about this. Small states, however, are worried, because they, they see this as just nothing but an opportunity for the larger states to basically become bullies, to become pushy, to really get their way when it comes to the laws, and to get their way when it comes to the enforcing of those laws. And that's because the larger states are going to have a larger number of people in the House of Representatives and in the Senate to make those kinds of decisions. Now, because this is such a sticky point, and because the large states and small states are really arguing with each other, New Jersey decides to present their own plan. And you've got to kind of recognize New Jersey is not a large state, although it may, may be argued that it's not exactly a small state either. But New Jersey suggests that there be three branches of government still with the ability to do two things, to tax and to regulate commerce or to regulate trade. In other words, this government needs to be supreme, but it really needs to be supreme only in really two areas, and that is taxation and when it comes to regulating business. And then we also want, under the New Jersey plan, they suggest that there should be one state, one vote, going back to that old Articles of Confederation system, one state, one vote, not one state, and you get as many votes as representatives you send. In other words, there needs to be equal representation. In other words, there's no difference with the New Jersey plan between small states and large states. Delaware is just as powerful as New York. Virginia is, is the, has the same amount of power as Rhode Island. That's the idea of equal representation. And in one sense, this doesn't seem right. I mean, if you look at the fact that, you know, maybe New York has 
50,000 people in it and Delaware has 10,000 people in it, and if they're equal in power, then really the 10,000 people in Delaware are proportional to the 10,000 people, the first 10,000 people in New York. But what about the other 30,000 people in New York? Don't they get representation? And this really is the argument the large states make. We're sort of getting cheated here. We should, we should be getting more, and we're not getting more. And the small states are like, yeah, but this way we have equal power, and we don't have to worry about you trampling all over us. The net result of all this is something called the Great Compromise. And the Great Compromise is proposed by Connecticut, and so sometimes it's called the Connecticut Compromise. It's at this point, really, that the problem is, is so bad that some of the states are threatening to walk out, in particular the smaller states. And then when the New Jersey plan, again, now that some of the larger states are saying, well, we're going to walk out of here too, we're not going to be part of this. Ben Franklin tries to sort of calm the whole room. Now, Ben Franklin, and again, talk about big people in the room, and maybe in a literal sense, because Ben Franklin is, is very much overweight. He's also in his early 80s. But Ben Franklin suggests something that is really kind of out of step for Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin is not a religious person. Um, he's not anti-religious, but he's just not a religious person. And, and he stands up and he says to, to George Washington, he says, you know, I want to remind you, Mr. President, referring to George Washington as president of the convention, I want to remind you, Mr. President, what we did during the darkest days of the revolution. In 76, when you were running from the British from New York and we were desperate for some sort of victory, here we had just declared our independence and we found ourselves being beat up daily by the British. The Continental Congress in a really bad spot, feeling like everything was going to be lost soon, agreed that it would be a very good idea to do something every day to not really just boost, to really boost the, the morale of the Congress. That wasn't really the point. But it was to recognize something, and that is that you get the brightest people in the same room, that isn't necessarily going to solve the biggest problems. You need help. And so what Ben Franklin reminds them of is that in those dark days, the Continental Congress agreed to pray before every meeting, to really ask for assistance, in a sense, for guidance, for wisdom, for the things that they needed. And so Ben Franklin suggests that they begin doing this in the Constitutional Convention. And again, it's amazing because Ben Franklin's not Mr. Religious. He's really not the person that you'd go to if you had a question about religion at all. The other thing that's really amazing is that they begin doing this in the Constitutional Convention, and they do it all the way to the very end. And then when the Constitution is accepted and ratified and becomes our government, and we begin to set up our national government with a Congress and a president and with the Supreme Court, the Congress of the United States begins to open every session, every day, with prayer. As a matter of fact, you go to Congress today and you're going to find that they open every session, every day, with prayer. That prayer starts before the official meeting begins. So if the meeting begins at 8 o'clock, they begin at 7.55. But they have a few minutes of prayer, and then the meeting begins. It's still something that we do today. So what does this, this uh, Connecticut Compromise or Great Compromise actually say? Well, first of all, the House of Representatives, what Connecticut suggests is that it be based on population. So big states have more votes than small states. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. But then I'll put a little twist on it. The Senate is going to be based on equal representation, sort of like the New Jersey plan. The difference here is, as much as it's equal representation, the Senate will be based on a very simple formula. That is two votes, two representatives, two votes for every state. Okay, so it's not just equal in the sense of send as many as you want and you only get one vote. It's two votes, two people for every state, for the Senate. Therefore, it becomes pretty obvious that the House of Representatives is really meant to represent the people of the United States. They represent the small communities they come from, these representatives, in the national legislative branch. And the Senate is meant to represent the states. Now, there's another way of describing them, and that is this. The Senate really is recognized as being the upper house, whereas the lower house is, meant, is recognized as being the House of Representatives. And this goes back to, in fact, the Parliament. We have in Parliament, we have the House of Commons, which represents the average people. 
And then we have the House of Lords. And the Lords are the nobility, right? They're the upper they're the upper house. They are the ones with their noses in the air, so to speak. And so what we have is, in the Senate, kind of an upper house mentality. Why? Because in the House of Representatives, there might be 5, 10, 15 people from your state, depending on how large it is, coming from a wide variety of areas. But when it comes to the members of the Senate, there's only two people from your state. And if your state's the size of something like Pennsylvania, there's a lot of people to choose from in that state. And if you're one of the two chosen, boy, that's a big deal. Now, the other part of this is, and this goes back to when we've talked about the idea of bicameral, that in order for laws to be made under this system with the Great Compromise, the Connecticut Compromise, we're going to make sure that both the houses of Congress, the, the House of Representatives and the Senate, in order to make a law, they both have to pass it. They both have to agree to the same law before it becomes a law. So we can't just have, for instance, the, the, the House, which represents the people of the United States, saying, yes, this should be a law. We have to have the, the wisdom of the people that represent the states. They have to say, yep, we agree with that. That should become a law. And this really is a safeguard. It's, it's a protection, in a sense. It's a protection because you can imagine the people that represent, the representatives in the House of Representatives that represent the people of the United States, there's a lot of pressure on, the, on them. Because they, they, they go back to their communities and their communities are saying things. We need a new bridge here and we need you know, a new highway here today. Or, you know, City of Orlando wants a community pool. And the result is that when you start hearing that from your community, from the people that voted for you, there's this pressure on you to go back to Congress, to go back to Washington, D.C. and say to the members of Congress, this is what my community wants. Well, you can imagine everybody else is going, so what? Well, well then you get into this discussion. Well, look, at you got this idea, you say to somebody else. You got this idea that, you know, you want this particular bill passed and, and you want my vote. Well, I'll tell you what, I will vote for your bill. I will vote for your idea and make it a law if you put my pool in your idea, in your bill, in, in your law. And if you'll do that, then I'll vote for yours. And so all of a sudden, this, this House of Representatives becomes this kind of exchange of favors where people are just spending other people's money and getting the things that they want. And this is a serious concern. And so when you look at this page of the notes, this is really meant to kind of spell this out for you so that you can understand it. But why this distinction between the House, Houses of Congress and the House of Representatives elected by the people and the Senate chosen by the... And this is an important point, because early in our history, this is the way it was done. The Senate is chosen by the legislatures of the state. They're not even chosen by the people, for goodness sakes. They're chosen by the lawmakers of each state will choose two senators to go off and represent the state. So those two senators, they don't, they don't not really are connected to the people at all. They're, they're sort of disconnected from the people. They're connected to their state, to the lawmakers of their state. So the House members will always have to be responsive to the needs of the people of their state. They're always going to have to be. Why? Because they have to get reelected. If they don't respond to the needs of their members of their state, they're going to find themselves not getting the votes, and they're not going to get reelected. As a result... Members of the House will very often pass laws that, well, they cater to those needs. We want a pool in our community, so we're going to push that pool through Congress and make sure you get that pool. The problem is that could cost an awful lot of money. It might not cost much for one pool, but if everybody, everybody does something similar, you're going to find that there's an awful lot of money spent by the Congress, by the House of Representatives, on such things. So how do we prevent ourselves from being buried further into debt? How do we, how do we prevent the House of Representatives to, from really burying us so far into debt we can't get out? And the way we do that is that we make sure that the senators don't have that kind of connection. We disconnect the senators from those people. And we make sure that they understand that there's a, a responsibility that they have. That their job is to really balance the, the, uh, the needs of the few people in each area of a state with the good of the entirety, the, the whole of a state. Right? The question is, what can we really afford? And, and the senators have a better understanding of that, at least they're supposed to, because they represent states and the states are communicating with them, saying, you know, that sounds like a great idea, but we can't afford that, so let's not do that. And so when that bill or that idea comes from the House of Representatives, the senators are in a position where they can say, you know, yeah, it sounds great, but this is not something we can afford. This is not something that is a good idea. We're going to stop it here. We're not going to let it become a law.
Now, as much as we feel like we've solved a problem with the big state, small state issue, we've got another problem, and that is slavery. And you might not think it's the first slavery is really, you know, hasn't been discussed yet. What's the big deal? Well, the problem is this. How do you count the population of a state when some states have slaves and some don't? I mean, what do you do about the slaves? Do you count them? Do you not count them? Do you count some of them? And this really is the question. Because if the House of Representatives and is based on population, and we've got to figure out then what the population of each state is, we're going to have to figure out how many people are in the state, and we're going to have to count that population. Now the question becomes, do we count the slaves? The northern states are very clear on this. You might say, well, the northern states, well, they, they don't like slavery, right? And, and so the, their attitude is, well, these, these slaves are people. We, we, we better make sure we, we count them. Well, no, just the opposite. The northern states say, no, don't, don't count them. Why? They don't have any slaves. They don't have any slaves. Don't count them. We don't have any. Count all of our people, which, by the way, includes some black people that are free. Southern states, on the other hand, say, oh, no, wait, count the slaves. I mean, we got a very small white population, but when you look at the, the population of the slaves and you add that to it, all of a sudden, bam, all of a sudden, we become huge in our population. We want you to count the slaves. And now, all of a sudden, the argument becomes very vicious because of the fact that the northern states are going to look at the southern states and say, how hypocritical of you. You don't think that they're people. You treat them like they're cattle, and you turn around and you say, count them, they're people. Well, what are they? And, of course, the southern states say, you're the hypocrites. The problem is, you think that you have no connection to slavery. Oh, we freed them all, you say. Oh, we don't have slavery in our state, except you continue to participate in the slave trade, and your hands are as dirty as ours. And so all of a sudden, this becomes sort of a moral contest. You know, who's better than who? Who's, you know, sort of got cleaner hands than the other group when it comes to the issue of slavery? And, and the result is, we're, we're on the verge of having another problem. You know, where's Ben Franklin when you need him? Well, lo and behold, that's just what happens. Franklin again stands up, and this time when he stands up, his, his comments are... Well, they're just kind of cryptic. They're, they're I don't know, muddled. They're, they don't seem to make sense at first. He says, Mr. President, referring again to Washington, he says, Mr. President, I've often wondered about your chair. I've often wondered about what that chair says about us and this meeting and, and the purpose of our meeting here. And what you see on the screen here is really George Washington, the back of George Washington's chair. And you'll notice that in this chair we have what appears to be a sun. And he's, and he's pointing out that there's this sun back there. And everybody recognizes the sun, but what's the, what's the point? And he says, what I'm wondering is this. Is that sun rising or is that sun setting? Is this the beginning of a nation, a beginning of a new birth of a country, a sunrise, or is this a sunset? Are we fading away before we've even gotten started? And I guess one of the things that he kind of points out to people in saying this is that you know, you can argue about these petty little things, these disagreements we have, but if you don't realize then see the big picture, what we're trying to accomplish here, you're going to not have a country because you argued over puny little things. Make sure that you are staying focused on the prize, on the thing we want to do, the, the goal, which is to have a country that runs and operates and protects everybody's natural rights. And so Franklin's really kind of able to get people back, focused back on what they need to do. And the three-fifths compromise really is the result. Now this compromise is reached and what it says is basically when you go to count the population of a state, the population of a state is going to be equal to all free people and three-fifths of the slaves. Not all of them, three-fifths of them. Now, when you look at this, you might think to yourself, well, that, you know, that seems reasonable. We're not going to count all of them. We'll count some of them. Of course, if, if you're looking at the, if you're the southern states, you're not happy. And if you're the northern states, you're not happy entirely either. This really is a compromise. I mean, compromise in the truest sense. You know, it's like, we're going to do this or we can do that. Or we can do something in the middle. Well, what about 50% of the slaves? What about one-third of the, you know, percent of the one-third of the slaves? Uh, well, what about five, you know, eighths? What about three-fifths? And they finally come to this fraction that they can all agree upon. Sad part about it is, one way or the other, it just doesn't sound good. You know, black people are either, you know, three-fifths of a white person 
or only three-fifths of all the black people really matter and the other two-fifths don't. Doesn't sound nice one way or the other. It sounds rotten one way or the other. Now, the other thing that they agreed to, because they knew that this was going to be an issue, what, what, what if we agree to this whole thing and we get a new government and we start that government and Congress turns around, the House and the Senate turn around, and they begin to dabble with and mess with and sort of manipulate slavery? Well, what are we going to do then? We can find ourselves agreeing to this whole thing and keeping our slaves, say the southern states, and then only find out that we don't, can't have slaves because Congress gets rid of them. Well, what they do also is they agree to not, until, until 1808, to really not touch, to not do anything about the slave trade. So until 1808, they could not in any way regulate, control the slave trade. Lo and behold, in 1808, they turn around and they ban it. They stop it. They just outright say no more slaves can be traded in the United States. In September of 1787, at the end of the summer, the Constitution is signed. Three delegates to the convention refuse to sign it. And the main reason they give is because it doesn't contain a Bill of Rights. You say, there's no list of rights here. You've created this incredibly powerful government and you've not done anything to protect the people against this power. We want a Bill of Rights. The Constitution is going to require nine out of the 13 states to ratify it. Now, you might be saying to yourself, wait a minute, but it said 13 states. 13 states out of 13 to amend the Articles. This is a one serious amendment here. The question is, why don't we have to have 13 states then approve it? Well, they knew this, that if they can get nine out of 13, the remaining states are going to jump on board pretty quick. I mean, the, the reality is... Delaware is not going to be, want to be the last state remaining that's not part of this larger country and therefore doesn't have the protection of this larger country. And so 9 out of 13 they thought was good enough to ratify, and the word ratify here means to approve, to approve the Constitution. And that ratification process, just so you know, doesn't mean that the people of each state will vote on it. Instead, the lawmakers of each state will vote on whether the Constitution is a good thing or not. So what does the Constitution look like? This is kind of a basic or general description. It's going to have three branches of government. The legislative is called the Congress. It has a House and a Senate. The House of Representatives is based on population, okay, elected by the people. And the Senate is based on the formula of two per state. And it's selected by the state legislatures. In other words, the legislatures of each state will, will pick their two senators. Now, a little note here. The Senate was changed in 1913 by the 17th Amendment. That change did something rather dramatic. And we talked about how the Senate really kind of stands as, as the guard against the abuse of that kind of, you know, catering to the people constantly. Well, in 1913, the Constitution was amended, and it allowed the people of the state to vote for senators, which means that the senators become just like the members of the House of Representatives, in the sense that they have to really cater to the people of their state in order to get reelected, instead of just being selected by the members of their state legislature. Serious problem, in my opinion. There's also an executive branch called the president, chosen by the Electoral College. We'll talk about the Electoral College later. There is the judicial branch, appointed by the president. And this new government would have the power to set and collect taxes and to regulate trade amongst a large number of other things, aside from that. So this is what basically what they agree upon is a general description of the Constitution, a basic outline of the government. Now, the last two things we're going to talk about here are the two groups of people. Really, when the Constitution goes back to the states and it's time for approval, well, guess what? Two groups or two camps of people establish themselves. There's one in favor of the Constitution and one opposed to the Constitution. And the, those that are in favor are called Federalists. They support the Constitution because it created a federal government. Okay, they like the idea of this thing called a federal government. Now, you don't see the word federal anywhere in the Constitution. This is their description of what the Constitution is. Okay? And what this means is, is that power is shared. Shared with who? Well, the power is shared between the national government, called the federal government, and the states. So the states have some responsibilities. The federal government has some responsibilities. And one of the things about the Constitution really is that it's not, those two things are so, not supposed to cross over. So the national and federal government is supreme, yes, but the states retain or keep some power. 
Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, James Madison, they all defend the Constitution state by state as it's voted on by the state legislatures, as it goes to each state legislature. They're, they go to those states. They camp out in those cities, basically. They listen to what the discussions that are going on. They listen to the arguments being made in favor of and against the Constitution. And they begin to write something very, very powerful called the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers is basically a series of newspaper articles that are written in each state. So if you look at the Federalist Papers, they even tell you what state they're writing this in. And they number them, Federalist number one, Federalist number two, Federalist number three. And each one says New York, or it says, you know, it says, you know, Maryland. It tells you what state they're in. And then what it also does is it explains the arguments that are being made against the Constitution at that time in that state. And so, for instance, if they're arguing about the, the president being selected by an electoral college, well, then guess what? What Madison and Hamilton and John Jay do is they write a newspaper article anonymously, and they say, well, this isn't really something to be concerned about, and here's the reason why. Here's the reason why we chose to do this, and this is the reason why it's a good thing. And they publish it in the newspaper. They're really trying to build up public opinion in favor of the Constitution, and it's a very, very successful sort of advertising campaign. The Federalist Papers have become, then, really, if you want to know about the Constitution and the reasoning behind it and what James Madison, the father of the Constitution, thought when these ideas were hammered out and argued out in the convention, you can read the Federalist Papers and their arguments in favor of it. And there's some very good copies of that that you can read that are very easy to read compared to other copies. Now, the Anti-Federalists, on the other hand, well, they're opposed to the Constitution. And they're opposed to it. Why? Well, they're opposed to it because, back like those three other guys that said they wouldn't sign it, they're opposed to it because it doesn't have a Bill of Rights. They argue that this government we've created is a threat to personal freedom. And it's a threat to personal freedom because it allows the government to, those two things we talked about, to tax people, to tax states, and to collect those taxes, which really kind of reminds people too much of the pre-revolutionary time period and also to regulate trade among the states, to control business. And this is something that really kind of made people nervous. They really believed that this was going to be, this is sort of a major hit or a major detriment to their personal liberty. Well, lo and behold, what happens is the Constitution is ratified by the states in 1788, and the main reason is because with all the arguments, the, the Federalists are beginning to realize there's enough people and enough states that are concerned about this Bill of Rights issue that as long as they promise that there's going to be a Bill of Rights, the, the Anti-Federalists say, okay, if you do that, then we'll, we'll ratify this Constitution. We'll accept it. And so the Federalists do that. They promise there's going to be a Bill of Rights. And, and what the amazing thing is, is as soon as this, uh, this is all taken care of and the, the Congress is selected and we have an election, there's a president and so on, one of the first orders of business for this new Congress is to be to propose a Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights is very quickly proposed and, and ratified by the states and approved and put into the Constitution very, very rapidly. By 1791, we've already got that taken care of. So just a matter of a couple of years, they've got the Bill of Rights in place. At this point then, we have a government. You know only, however, a fraction of what you need to know about the Constitution. You know how it all came about. You know the arguments in favor of and against certain things. You recognize that there's uh, some level of disagreement among the states when it comes to certain issues. And you recognize that there's been some changes made since the time of the Constitutional Convention that may have not been the best decisions to make when it comes to, for instance, how we select senators. But all in all, what you know is a very small fraction of the information you need to know for the Constitution. And so we're going to begin looking more deeply then into the Constitution itself and understanding how this government was really put on paper. What are the nuts and the bolts and the, all the, the little specifics of how this government runs today?